So welcome everyone who's out there. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Jens Zimmerman. I'm the director of the James M. Houston Center here at Regent College. And I want to welcome you to our last public lecture in the lecture series on the theology of the person. And uh, today is a special event because we had planned this final lecture with a very prominent speaker, uh, Margaret Somerville, to be a kind of inaugural lecture for the Houston Center. And then, as you all know, comes this thing called COVID and COVID policies, and it threw a kind of a wrench into the works. So unfortunately, Professor Somerville couldn't travel here in person, but she was gracious enough to do the event for us on Zoom. So we'll have uh, this inaugural lecture for the Houston Center on Zoom. And tonight, we also have the privilege of actually having with us uh, in the audience, uh, Professor James Houston, who is, of course, the inspiration behind the Houston Center. He is at, uh, Jim, what is it, almost 100 years of age now. He is a, co a founder of Regent College, a former president of Regent College. So allow me then to introduce to you our inaugural speaker for the James M. Houston Center in this lecture series, uh, Professor Margaret Somerville, who should be known to most of you, I'm sure. Um, she is Samuel Gale, Professor of Law Emerita, Professor Emerita in the Faculty of Medicine, and founding director emerita of the Center for Medicine, Ethics, and Law at McGill University, Montreal, where she taught until 2016, when she then returned to Sydney to there become professor of bioethics in the School of Medicine at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. She's authored several books. Uh, some titles here are The Ethical Canary, uh, Canary Science, Society, and the Human Spirit, and with Penguin 2000, and another title is Death Talk, The Case Against Euthanasia and Physician Assisted Suicide, 2002. Another famous work of hers is The Ethical Imagination, Journeys of the Human Spirit, 2006. And then, of course, there are the CBC Massey Lectures from 2006. Um, and her latest uh, recent book, Birds on Ethics Wire, on an Ethics Wire, Battles About Values in the Culture Wars. And one of the reasons that um, Professor Somerville was fortuitously kept from coming here was that she's actually in the process, uh, as she told me, in Australia to um, fight euthanasia laws that are coming uh, or proposed to come into the country. And uh, so she's well, obviously well prepared to lecture to us on the person, on personhood and bioethics. And her lecture today will respond to the question, does personhood help us make wise decisions in bioethics? So Professor Somerville, thank you very much for agreeing to give this lecture and the floor is yours. Right, so um, here that is the, the um, uh, title of my lecture. Can the concept of personhood help us to make wise decisions in bioethics? It's easy enough to make a decision, but the question is, is it a wise one? And so an overview of my lecture is, is personhood a useful concept in bioethics? Who or what is a person and why does this definition matter in bioethics? Should we recognize non-human persons? What are the variations on the theme of personhood? And what is the impact of values and culture on the definition of personhood and vice versa? Now you'll notice that I'm, I've taken a questioning approach and I believe that's the fundamental methodology in applied ethics, which is bioethics, that we, we go about asking as many of the right questions as we can in order to find our way through these often very difficult gray areas that we're facing in bioethics. Now, they're important concepts in bioethics because depending on how they're defined and used determines what we see as ethical. So, and those concepts include person. Are all humans persons? Are only humans persons? Human dignity. Do all human beings have human dignity, which may, must be respected, or only persons? 
human rights, how do they relate to human dignity? Autonomy, how does this relate to personhood? And what is precedent? Sorry, and what is presentism? That's a term that I invented, so you'd think I'd be able to say it. So is personhood a useful concept in bioethics? And the most accurate response to that question, which is the title of my talk, is that it is the lawyer's answer. The lawyer's answer is that depends. And it depends whether both the definition and application of the per concept of personhood in practice is useful, useless, or dangerous. Personhood is useful when it helps us to treat other people with respect, to honour their human rights, and to protect fragile and vulnerable people. It's useful when it helps us to find a common starting point on which we can all agree. For example, we all agree in the end of life decision making debate that physicians and other healthcare professionals must relieve serious pain, uh, must relieve serious pain, and it's unethical not to provide this. Now, why that is important is not because it provides the pain relief that somebody needs, but such agreement creates an experience of all belonging to the same moral universe, which can alter the tone of our subsequent disagreements and conflicts. For example, in the euthanasia debate, which as Professor Zimmerman said, I'm heavily involved in here at the moment in Australia, we can all agree that we must relieve suffering, but where we disagree is on the acceptable ethical means to relieve that suffering. Pro-euthanasia people think that it's acceptable and ethical to use a lethal injection. Anti-euthanasia people reject that. Second category is personhood is useless when there's no agreement who or what is a person or what respect for a person requires, which raises the issue of respect for human dignity. Is respect for their human dignity a right all humans have? Now we can give some examples of failure of that respect. It's pretty universally recognized, I think totally probably, that slavery and trafficking in persons for organ transplantation are examples of failing to respect human dignity. One of the things I thought about when I wrote that was, well, what about commercial surrogate motherhood? A woman is treated by wealthy commissioning parents and huge massively profit making fertility industry, billions of dollars of profit worldwide now, as just a uterus for hire, which commodifies and reifies her, reifies, turns her into a useful thing. And then I went on to think about, I have never seen it discussed, is surrogacy also a breach of the resulting child's human dignity or human rights? I'm inclined to think that it probably is. What is the definition of human dignity and what is its relationship to personhood? There are three major United Nations conventions highly relevant to bioethics. They are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UNESCO Declaration on Bioethics and the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. Now together, they demand respect for human dignity 23 times, but nowhere do they define it. So I started wondering, why would that be? And there is an explanation in a report of the President's Commission of the United States on bioethics. It, one of the uh, chapter writers in that explained that regarding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this was not an accidental oversight, rather to get the widest possible buy-in to the whole instrument. The definition of human dignity was avoided because it was known that they could not obtain consensus on it and people who disagreed would not sign on to the declaration. 
I think that same uh, is true for the other declarations I've listed there, because they too do not define what human dignity is, although they constantly call for it, particularly in relation to the new genetics. These instruments also refer to respect for human rights. So that raises the question of the relation of human dignity and human rights. Professor Dansel Macy from the Kennedy Institute for Ethics at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, argues that human rights establish the conditions that are required if inherent human dignity is to be respected. In short, human rights are the legal instruments for implementing respect for human dignity. Therefore, if a person being seen as having human dignity is a necessary precursor to their having human rights and having human dignity depends on their being characterized as a person, the definition of personhood is of critical importance in terms of respect for them and protection of their human rights, which leads to the third possible way in which the concept of personhood can function. Personhood is a dangerous concept when it's used as an exclusionary device, that is in such a way that it places, for example, fragile and vulnerable people at serious risk and denies them protections, including human rights, to which they would be entitled if they were seen as persons. So let's look at who or what is a person and why this definition matters in bioethics. Now, there are several approaches to defining personhood, but the basic one is this. It's the status view of personhood versus the criterial view. These are two mutually exclusive approaches. One is that all human beings are persons uh, or only human beings with certain characteristics or capacities of persons, which is a second approach. This can be expressed as dividing humans into two categories, human beings and they're all persons and human doings and they're the ones that have the capacities that count for being a person. And if you don't have those capacities, you're not a person and the protections of personhood do not apply to you. So does it matter in bioethics which of those two views we adopt, the status view or the criterial view? If recognition of, of one's human rights depends on one being a person, exclusionary definitions are dangerous. The status view, all human beings and only human beings are person, means that personhood is an intrinsic status and cannot be lost. You're a human being from the time you're conceived to the time that you die. This is an inclusionary definition of personhood. The criterial view, only some human beings, those who fulfill certain criteria, and these are some of the ones that are used, able to relate to others, self-awareness, memory of the past, emotional capacity, they are persons and personhood is an extrinsic status conferred by others, which can be lost or withheld. And there's a very interesting history behind that view. It was originally an elitist view, which was knocked out by the advent of Christianity and the teaching that all people, all humans are equal. So you couldn't have that view that, you know, you had to have certain capacities. You had to be in an elite before you were a person. So what we need to query or I queried when I was going through this and writing this text, does the criterial definition of personhood conflate personhood with competency or mental capacity? 
which requires a person to be able to understand and appreciate information to make a legally valid decision. Now, capacity is an important doctrine in bioethics. So it's called alternatively competency or mental capacity. And it counts because it, it matters whether you, you have that mental capacity in order to give a valid informed consent, for example, to surgery. So I, it, that does matter. I, it, and I think this is a conflation of that, that you are really saying you're only a person if you've got this mental capacity. I also note that omitting the word person is often a sign of disrespect. For example, we speak of the aged compared with elderly persons. We speak of the handicapped compared with persons with disability. Mental incompetence compared with mentally incompetent persons. We don't say mental competence, we say mentally competent persons. Criminals, delinquents, Aborigines compared with Aboriginal people. It's now very shunned in Australia to say Aborigines. You've got to say Aboriginal people or people of Aboriginal descent or First Nations people. And then you get into the medical context, which of course I'm involved in. And you used to hear physicians say things like the heart in emergency or the kidney in room 20 in contrast to the patient or Mrs. Smith who has renal failure. And again, we're trying to uh, help people not to do that. And it also occurred to me that this is a manifestation of what's called depersonalization, which is actually a psychiatric state, but this is others depersonalizing another person. So questions relevant to bioethics that these two different concepts of personhood raise include, are people with advanced Alzheimer's disease still persons? Status view? Yes, they're still human, so yes. Criterial view, no, they can't do the things the criteria demand. Are human embryos or fetuses persons? Again, yes, on the status view, they're living human beings just at the early stage of human development. And the answer is no for the criterial definition because they don't have the required capacities. How do the different concepts of personhood mean for how we see the ethics of human embryo research? Status view has a lot of reservations from about it. Uh, criterial view, because they're not persons, it's probably allowed. Human cloning, very difficult question to answer. One issue is, is it ethically relevant, whether it's for reproductive or research purposes? What has happened in uh, secular bioethics is that reproductive human cloning, that is cloning a living human being, is seen as acceptable for, for research, whereas that's not the case for the status view. And this is a big one at the moment, designing our children and their descendants, alteration of the human germ, germ cell line, the genes passed on from generation to generation. Again, is it ethically relevant whether the intervention is for therapy, that is you're trying to, for example, pull out the Huntington Korea gene that causes serious mental illness and death in people who have it during their 30s or early 40s, or you're doing it because you want a child with high intelligence, sporting ability, blue eyes and blonde hair. Are we moving to what the transhumanists call a post-human future, where natural humans, or they call them also unmodified humans, are obsolete models? Does building better babies make, make it ethical? Is genetics Pandora's box or an unprecedented gift? I recently heard a bioethicist here in Australia give a paper 
on how being able to design your children was equivalent to the iPhones. And you wouldn't want now to have a, a Model 6 iPhone when the Model 12 is out. And he said, well, this is going to be what it's like for these children, that the earlier models that were designed will be obsolete compared with the later models of that. So this is a summary of the relation of personhood and human dignity. Definitions of person and human dignity are interwoven as both include inclusive and exclusive, excluding definitions. An intrinsic definition of personhood and dignity, one is a person with dignity simply if one is human. This is a status model. Personhood and dignity come with being a human being and cannot be lost. The extrinsic definition of personhood and dignity, one is a person and has dignity only if you have certain capacities and others see one as having dignity. Personhood and dignity are conferred and therefore can be taken away. This is the functional or criterial model. If only persons have human dignity that must be respected, what does denying personhood and thereby the attribution of dignity entail in bioethics? Now, there's an enormously respected, renowned physician ethicist, American Dr. Leon Katz, and he's, here is his warning. Today, human dignity is of paramount importance especially in matters bioethical. As we become more and more immersed in a world of biotechnology, we increasingly sense that we neglect human dignity at our peril, especially in light of gathering powers to intervene in human bodies and minds in ways that will affect our very humanity. He also writes about the wisdom of repugnance which can be an important tool in ethical discernment. Is it repugnant not to recognize a human being as being a person and having human dignity? The new technologies face us with questions no humans before us have ever had to contemplate. For example, is there an essence of our humanness we must hold on trust for future generations? Is the natural human genome part of this essence as the common heritage of humankind that we must not lay waste? Is respect for human dignity one way we can protect that essence and fulfill that trust? Do some utilitarians, in particular scientists, reject this concern because of human dignity because it restricts what they want to do. Certainly that's been my experience in dealing with them. I was once at an invited only conference when the technology became available in 2015 to alter the human genome of an embryo. And I had a big argument with Steven Pinker from Harvard University. And he wanted to go ahead with using this technology, particularly in a research context. And so when I objected and gave a paper saying why we shouldn't do this, he got up and said, well, as for Margaret Somerville, what we should do is not stop doing this science. We should get rid of the bioethicists. So, you know, that's what happens. So in, a, in an everyday context, the pro-euthanasia lobbyist slogan is uh, death with dignity. Uh, is intentionally ending the life of a person a true recognition and affirmation of their dignity? This is what we need to ask. Then a second approach to um, what is personhood and human dignity is what I've called a developmental compared with a constructionist view of personhood. And abortion is a good example of the difference it makes, which view of personhood you take. Now, this is not my original idea. This is a, a American lawyer ethicist, Richard Stith came up with this. Should the fact that the fetus 
uh, is a living human being confer personhood on him or her, eliciting respect and protection, that's a status view, or is more required, the criterial view? And again, the issue is whether personhood and the requirement of respect for human dignity elicit, it elicits is an intrinsic or extrinsic characteristic. In relation to abortion, the two views can be described as the developmental compared with the constructionist view. The constructionist view ties in with that phrase I've already used, building better babies. And at least before viability, uh, that is the point at which if you delivered the baby, it would have a chance of living, which is usually put around 20 weeks of pregnancy. This view does not recognize that the fetus deserves protection because it is not a person. An analogy is made to constructing a house. And these people argue when the foundation is laid, you don't have a house. The point at which one does, short of completing the building, is debatable. And so they debate at which point, if any, uh, the fetus should be protected. And in Canada, for example, currently, there is absolutely no protection for a fetus until it is delivered vi viable and alive from the um, body of its mother. So it can go from, and it can go from complete uh, you, people, other people say the developmental view means you've got the, the initial early developed person present at the beginning. And one of the analogies they look, use is they look at a pear tree seedling and see it as already having a full capacity in the right circumstances to become the adult pear tree. And the seedling and the adult tree are one entity. They argue likewise the fetus and the future adult it becomes. Therefore, the, uh, the fetus deserves protection of its life from conception, just as the adult will deserve protection of their life, providing they are regarded as a person, which of course, if, if it's because they're a human being, well, they will be. Now, there's also, and I understand that you've done some work on this for so the students present and uh, have read the book on it. The distinction between person and product. Is a human being a somebody or a something that is a person and something a product? Yet again, we see the difference between a status view of personhood and a functional view. The status view, all human beings are somebodies, persons. The criterial view, it is ethical to treat some humans as somethings. Now, I came across a prominent politician here in Australia who's the former premier of uh, the state of Victoria, who's a big supporter of euthanasia. And here's what he said. When you're past your use by or best before date, you should be checked out as quickly, cheaply, and efficiently as possible. I argue that human beings are not products to be checked out of the supermarket of life. They are some bodies, not some things. Should we recognize non-human persons? This is the third part of my lecture. If there are human, non-persons, the criterial view, because they don't fulfill the criteria for personhood, are they non-human persons? Because they do fulfill at least some of these criteria. Do only humans have dignity that must be respected or do animals also have it? Is there a discontinuity between humans and other animals? Are humans and other animals different in kind or only different in degree? Are we wrongfully discriminating in treating humans as deserving special respect and treatment? And this is what's called the human exceptionalism argument. They are different in kind versus the speciesism argument. They're only different in degree. And you'll notice here again, look at those statements. They, they are not statements, they are questions. So I'm trying here to uh, send a message 
that we have to have respectful questioning of the views of each side of these arguments. Are animals persons? I would argue no, and the reason is if we grant personhood to some animals, we will withdraw it from some human beings. And we, you, we, the argument for making animals persons is to prevent cruelty to animals. And this is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, there's a documentary called The Cove, which testifies to the horrible slaughter and brutal and cruel treatment of dolphins in Japan. Likewise, Matthew Scully's book, Dominion, documents the hell factory farm animals endure. We must stop these practices. Some ethicists, philosophers and scientists suggests conferring personhood on some animal species to protect them through ethics and law, including by attributing rights to them. I strongly endorse preventing cruelty to all sentient creatures, but not through making animals persons for the reason up above, that, we will, that means we will withdraw it from some human beings. It would undermine the idea that humans are special relative to other animals and therefore deserve special respect. It also endorses a criterial view of personhood. Whether humans are special, human exceptionalism or uniqueness is controversial and central question in bioethics with major impact on what we view as ethical or unethical. Currently, we use the word person as a synonym for human and to indicate, communicate and implement the concept that humans are different from other animals and special. It cannot do that if it does not refer exclusively to humans. If animals become persons, human persons become animals and seeing humans as special and deserving of special respect is eliminated. It means that what we do or don't do to animal persons should be the same as what we do or don't do to human persons. And this argument is put forward. So for instance, if we have euthanasia for animals, we should likewise have it for humans. Uh, that argument is that you love your dog and you don't let him suffer. So you take him to the vet and have him euthanized. Why do you let your mother suffer? Because you love her too. She should be able to have a lethal injection. My short answer to that is your mother is not a dog. Um, also, we can go even further. If we, and Peter Singer, for example, practices this, which I admire greatly. If we don't eat humans, we shouldn't eat animals. And indeed, Peter uh, doesn't wear any animal products. Despite the fact that we strongly disagree about quite a few things, Peter and I are quite are good friends. And this is his approach. He argues that distinguishing humans from other animals and treating them differently is wrongful discrimination and uh, what he calls speciesism. He rejects that all human beings are persons and no animals are persons. And rather he believes that it depends on having certain capacities. Okay. Let's see, where are we? I'm sort of a bit lost here. For Singer, personhood depends on fulfilling criteria. The ones I've already listed being self-aware, uh, 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 having a sense of one's history and perhaps of a future and a capacity to relate to others. Some seriously mentally disabled humans and babies are not persons who do not have personhood protections, according to Peter. Thus, for example, a baby has no right to life and parents of a baby with disabilities could consent to her being euthanized. A couple of Italian bioethicists who were here on sabbatical in Australia proposed that we should have a concept of what they call post-birth abortion, that if you would have aborted the baby before it was born, if you'd known what its disabilities were, you should be able to have the baby euthanized afterwards. It caused an enormous fuss. Um, whether a living per a 
whom, whether a living being is a person and deserves the respect and protections, again, depends on its measuring up to a certain standard, however that standard is set. And this is an attribute or criterial approach. Applied to humans, this approach means those who don't have a certain level of physical, mental or emotional functioning and therefore are not persons, and as a result, don't have the same rights as other. In other words, it creates different categories of human beings, and those in some categories are not regarded as persons. The contrasting approach, to repeat what I've said before, all humans are persons, and only humans are natural persons. Hence the words human being and a person are interchangeable. Universal human personhood means every human being has an intrinsic dignity that must be respected and comes simply with being human, a status approach. The refusal of courts to recognize unborn babies as persons, for example, the Supreme Court of Canada did this in the Morgenthaler case, in order to allow abortion, shows the protective effect of the concept of personhood and that unless expressly excluded, all human beings are persons. We used to regard humans as special on the basis they had a soul, a divine spark, and animals did not. Far from everyone accepts that today, but most people at least act as though we humans have a human spirit. A metaphysical, although not necessarily supernatural element, as part of the essence of our humanness. The beautiful Sanskrit greeting, namaste, loosely translated by a, co a colleague of mine who's an expert in Hinduism said, he translates it as the light in me recognizes the light in you. And that captures that reality of the human spirit. Now, variations on the theme of personhood fairly quickly, uh, because I want to get to the fifth part. I want to try and convince you of something when I talk about that. Exceptions to all humans being persons include in Roman law, only free living adult men were persons, slaves, women and children like animals were chattels or property, not persons. In Canada, women were natural persons, so they weren't property, but they were not legal persons until the persons case of 1929, in which the Privy Council, which was still available in those days, overturned the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada. Non-human, non-natural legal persons have long been recognized in law. Uh, for example, companies are non-natural persons. It gives them standing to sue and be sued. Ships and aircraft can likewise be uh, plaintiffs and defendants. Non-human natural legal persons. Legislation confers personhood on other non-human entities to protect them. For example, there is an act in the Canadian law of protection of a pristine Arctic environment from environmental degradation. There are books called Rocks Have Rights and Trees Have Standing to Sue. That is, they're treated as legal persons, again, for environmental reasons. Environmental ethics are increasingly important in bioethics. I've argued animals should not be seen as persons, but, but should some, for example, the great apes, have rights or perhaps better have protections that come from us having obligations. In 1999, New Zealand granted all species of great apes rights as non-human hominids. Rights include protection from maltreatment, slavery, torture, death and extinction. In short, New Zealand implemented greater protections without attributing human rights to great apes or conferring personhood. More recently, Spain has done likewise. Animals should be protected from cruelty and we have obligations to provide some reasonable form of animal life, but not through personhood or even as some scientists and philosophers argue, the regarding them as moral agents. I once participated in a debate uh, where the topic was 
the uh, that the apes have ethics that they're moral agents and to my great surprise a lot of these scientists believe they do um perhaps you know that's not out of the question we need greater respect for all life especially human life and restricting personhood to humans helps implement the latter but it must not denigrate from our respect for all a non-human life and not just that which has high intelligence self-awareness emotional life etc and what respect requires will not be uniform for different forms of life we will be unable to maintain respect to maintain respect for human life unless we implement respect for all life and if we lose our respect for life we lose our humanity massive consequence what about robots and these are now being argued that they should be put into the law as persons if we protect rivers forests the artists chimpanzees by giving them legal standing possibility of seeking legal remedies through the courts what about robots what respect are they owed and should they have rights transhumanists do not believe that humans are special and that they and their humanists require special respect they do believe using new technology we're transitioning from human to a post human future where unmodified humans that is natural persons will be an obsolete model so questions their post human approach raises include if the respect owed to an entity depends on intelligence should super intelligent robots deserve more respect than natural humans what ethics should govern our decisions about redesigning the human mind what about manipulating human embryos genes to create fearless soldiers there's been research done again in canada uh where the, a gene from fighting fish who attacked all other fish were put into nice little calm gentle fish and the little gentle fish became warriors what if we did that to humans what are the ethics of extending the normal human lifespan to 150 years and beyond you might think that seems uh, incredible but we've already had ethics conferences on doing that there's two ways it can be done life extension that will develop artificial organs or organs from animals etc and would pair the human and what's called age retardation will intervene on the genes for aging so what is it often discussed is you reach puberty at 40 years of age and young adulthood at about 80 etc so amazing stuff So here I have a modest proposal for ethics regarding the new technologies. We need deep respect for the natural to respect human dignity. To implement that respect we should start from a basic presumption of respecting nature, the natural and life. Now this is not unchallenged. Some philosophers strongly disagree with this and accuse me of what they call the naturalistic fallacy. This does not mean that nature the natural and life must never be altered rather those altering them must justify doing so I propose a precautionary principle users of new technologies have the burden to prove that it's reasonably safe and I mean safe not just physically but mentally emotionally spiritually psychologically etc to do so New techno science faces us with questions no humans before us have ever have ever had to contemplate. We hold life itself in the palm of our collective human hand and can manipulate it with powers no humans before us have ever had. That's a huge privilege and a huge burden. So now the final section impact of values and culture on the definition of personhood and vice versa ever there's an evolution of values and there are diverse value packages bioethics is involved with values that's how they evolve and what they are or become is important in bioethics models for values evolution and change uh, are needed 
neither conservative nor progressive values are static. Now, I just want to give a word of warning here. Um, it's very difficult these days to split up values. You can probably talk about conservative and progressive values. You can no longer accurately talk about uh, conservative and progressive people with values because almost nobody has a consistent values um, package. For example, I am progressive on fiscal values. I'm conservative on social values, and a lot. And you can have all sorts of combination. And so I argue that the pendulum swinging from conservative to progressive, and I challenge the word progressive, I don't believe it always is progressive, but it's a convenient label, and I'm using it as that. So this pendulum swinging one way and back again with nothing changing in the interim is not an accurate image for understanding how societal values change. Rather, the imagine moving upwards on a helix as knowledge about ethics and values evolves. We can then look down to the past below us on the helix and bring forward from it the wisdom that is still needed and meld it with the new insights. The helix model allows, indeed it requires, taking into account what our collective human memory can teach us. Many progressive values adherents reject the past as having any worth or validity in informing contemporary values. See Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, which is called The Righteous Mind. It's well worth reading. And this, this is survey research of young people. The helix's upward trajectory also images the future to engage our collective human imagination to assess potential risks and harms, including to future generations of what we do now. As well, the helix model better images than the pendulum one that we need to be careful not to take our values positions to an extreme where they would do more harm than good. At a certain point on each side, the helix starts moving to the other side. The pendulum has no such inherent limitation. Moreover, the pendant pendulum model images two mutually exclusive sides regarding the values we espouse and conflict between them, a winner and a loser as to which values prevail. The helix model captures more nuance and possible diversity in the values it can accommodate. It also suggests that many values lie on a spectrum rather than existing solely at one or other pole. In fact, most people have values that lie along that spectrum and are not completely at one or other pole. The pendulum model does not image the mixed package of conservative and progressive values many people have. The helix model accommodates this reality in avoiding an image of polarization. It makes it more likely we'll, we'll find some unexpected alliances. And we can accommodate this possibility by imagining a double, double helix with intermittent connections between the two strands. An example is, for example, uh, very conservative uh, people who, uh, disagree with all abortion and disagree with surrogate motherhood and uh, feminists who are pro-choice on abortion but very anti-surrogate motherhood. Those two groups have combined in Europe in some instances to fight surrogate motherhood. And that's the sort of thing that can happen when we can see in more nuance and find where we can agree. People have very different, diverse packages. No two people have exactly the same collection of values, or if they do, their prioritization differs when values conflict. This is often referred to as a world of competing sorrows. And what that means in bioethics is there is no, no harm option. We have to decide who will be harmed. 
Now, autonomy is an important concept in bioethics and related to personhood because it raises the question, can you be a person with the rights and protections that entails if you are not capable of exercising a right to autonomy? Now, consistent with their criterial view of personhood, the progressive answer is no, you've got to have autonomy to be a person. The, conservative, the conservative's view is yes, you are still a person, even though you lack capacity to exercise your autonomy, because you, uh, you are a human. And that means you've got personhood and human dignity, even though you are not able to exercise autonomy. So a foundational value of the progressive values adherent is respect for autonomy. My body, my life, my choice is the mantra in the euthanasia debate. Individuals' autonomy is important, but like respect for freedom, it needs to have limits to prevent serious harm to the common good or the collective well-being. We've learned with COVID that our individual flourishing is bound up in collective well-being. What the limits on individual autonomy should be requires an understanding of our nature as human beings. We are not isolated atoms, as for example, that euthanasia argument, my body, my life, to my choice assumes, but we're social beings needing relationships which also need to be protected. What the limits on individual autonomy should be requires understanding our nature as human beings. So the feminist concept of relational autonomy takes this into account. It seeks to protect both individuals' right to decide for themselves and those individuals' relationships. The feminists speak about an ethic of caring, really important work and being developed currently. Pro-euthanasia advocates, for example, rely on what is called alternatively intense, radical or expressive individualism. We could call their position the tyranny of the right to individual autonomy. Expressive individualism means that when respect for individual autonomy and protecting the common good are in conflict, for example, because uh, giving rights to euthanasia gives a precedent for euthanizing fragile and vulnerable people, then an ethical balance between the individual autonomy and the common good is not sought, rather the individual autonomy is almost always given priority. Now, Carter Sneed, an American bioethicist, explains in his new book, What It Means to Be Human, this does not accord with reality or our lived experience as social beings and does not take into account or protect relationships or obligations flowing from these. He argues these obligations are inherent to each other and we have them simply because we're human beings, whether or not we have agreed to them. That is, we've got some inherent obligations to care for other human beings. Sneed accepts that the will or mind is an important element of, be, of what being human means and that respect for autonomy is a fundamental human right, but says it's an inadequate vision to explain the totality of what human being means. I suggest Sneed's view of autonomy reflects a status view of personhood and expressive autonomy, a criterial view. The status view focuses on the reality that we're all humans and defines the limits of individual autonomy accordingly to protect all human beings. The, the criterial view focuses only on mental capacity and likewise defines autonomy accordingly to protect only those with that capacity. Humans are more than just their mental functioning and the totality of being human must be valued and protected. And that's the job of bioethics. So it's no small job. Now, just yesterday, I came across this and added this slide. So I'm not really 
totally up to the mark on it, but I think it's extremely interesting. There's a new book out by Carl Truman, and it's a summary. This new book, Strange New World, is a summary of a 400 page argument he's published on this, which is far too dense, apparently, for the general public. But it also provides insights regarding the relation between autonomy and the two different concepts of personhood. Truman argues that giving priority to the value of expressive autonomy caused the person to become a self in that it shifted the societal focus in formulating its values from the external locus of respecting the personhood of all human beings to an internal locus of respecting the wishes and preferences of the individual self. It's tied up with uh, this idea of your life project is to actualize your, uh, your true self. And so that you can choose to be whatever you want to be. And this has got implications in bioethics for things like choose to be dead. Okay, you have to have euthanasia. Choose to be female, even though you're born biological male. Okay, we have to legalize transgender surgery and so on. You can see a lot of what fits into this. In short, the status concept of personhood focuses on protecting all human beings. Expressive autonomy focuses on the individual and protecting their right for themselves, their, their individuality. Now, I then thought a little bit about uh, expressive autonomy which is a subcategory of, I think, expressive freedom. And I earlier said to you that we talk about limitations on freedom. It's usually called freedom in fetters in the law. You can't have absolute freedom. And I think that what this is, is that uh, this is absolute autonomy and we need freedom on autonomy. So these are big questions. This is the final thing I just want to alert you to, presentism and its problems. Another current problem in bioethics is present generations belief they're the first enlightened people who've ever lived and they've got nothing to learn from the past or from contemplating future consequences of adopting certain values. I call that presentism. And that approach blocks learning from collective human memory and warnings from a collective human imagination and often denies any obligations to future generations and contains no requirement or space for considering such obligations. Climate change is an exception, and here the progressives on the whole are much better than the conservatives, because the climate change, people do consider lessons from the past and the consequences to, de to decide their conduct. Climate change threatens our physical ecosystem. We've also got a socio-cultural metaphysical ecosystem, the collection of values, stories, attitudes, beliefs, and so on, we buy, buy into to create the glue that binds us together as a society. This is Charles, a philosopher, Charles Taylor's social imaginary. Neither ecosystem is indestructible and both can be irremediably damaged. The question we must ask ourselves in relation to both in deciding on our values, for instance, who is a person, is not only how will my decision affect me and our present society, but also what kind of world will we bequeath to future generations? Might it be one in which no reasonable person would want to live? First Nations people have much to teach us in this regard. For example, Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people access human memory by consulting the elders and through collective human imagination. They look to the future they will leave to their descendants, their mob. Aboriginal dreaming looks beyond always giving priority to individual autonomy, to protection of the common good, vulnerable people, and very importantly, the earth, which they call country and regard as a living being that, is, that must be protected. 
We often criticize people for being stuck in the past. Our postmodern societies are stuck in the present. So in conclusion, the concept of personhood is foundational to bioethics. So it matters how we define and use it. Words in their definition matter in making decisions about ethical acceptability. To reason, these other ways of knowing include, for instance, moral intuition, examined emotions, imagination, common sense, experiential knowledge, and so on. Bioethics seeks to ensure respect for all life, especially human life. If you accept the validity of that purpose, it raises a question about personhood, which I will leave you to ponder. Which concept of personhood would be most likely to achieve and maintain respect for human life, both at the individual level of individual people and at the societal level in general, because we have to respect human life at both of those levels. Thank you for listening to me. And I hope then I haven't gone too far over. No, brilliant. I uh, hope you can hear me. I never quite know with this room. Uh, we're all freaked out now. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the, uh, the lecture. That was very rich, very good. Um, I'm sure there are, there are questions. Um, you know, just briefly, um, Margot, uh, um, Jim sends his regrets. They couldn't get the tech to work. So we'll just forget, uh, regretfully, we'll forget that about that. What we will now do is, if you have questions um, to Professor Somerville, could you please put them in the in the chat room? We have a few minutes that we can spend questions. I will just ask the my seminar class and the people in the room not to ask questions because we will just spend a few time a few minutes with the uh, Zoom audience. They can ask questions, and then we have another link where we'll just have a, a more intimate uh, round with uh, Professor. Uh, Somerville on the on questions. So those of you who are here for the public lecture, please feel free to write your question into the Zoom chat thing. I know there's probably a better term for that, and uh, we'll read them out for her to answer. James, perhaps you could uh, read out the questions. It'd be easier for me. Would that be okay? Yes, of course. We haven't received any yet. Yeah, we haven't received any yet. So I'll start with a question. Um, I was very intrigued where you ended up. So obviously, uh, I would totally agree. I'm just going to speak provocatively as a theologian for a minute here, if that if that is okay. Um, so where you ended up, um, obviously, the status view is the way to go. I would totally agree, right? You want the status view because otherwise, you will not have a handicapped person or a person that is not able to have the, the capacities that define supposedly personhood would then, we could just, as Peter Singer said, we could just terminate those. So the status view though, my question to you is where does this status come from? I mean, it doesn't come from biology. It doesn't, we just don't see it in a person necessarily. We can't see it under a microscope. So I would argue that this is a historically grown uh, sentiment or understanding that we have about the person, which comes really, to be provocative, comes from, uh, I would say, Judeo-Christianity or sort of monotheistic faith. It certainly comes to the Christian history, uh, to medieval, uh, to patristic and medieval discussions, what it is a person and the whole mystery of a person and so on. So how do you, if you interact with people that would not recognize that history, what do, you, what do you ground the status view of the person in? You were moving towards some things at the end, right? Respect for life um, and so on and so forth. But how do we, how do you ground this in the social imaginary if people just don't recognize the, the, the transcendent value, let's just say God or something like that, that, that grounded this view that historically grew this view for us like how, how do you how do you argue when okay. you yeah i got the question okay <laughs> um 
I have grounded it in this. You remember in one of the slides I mentioned the human spirit? Yes. I, I didn't define it in this lecture. As it was, I had too much material. Uh, but the human spirit is that deep sense of connection to other people, to the world, to nature, to the universe, to the cosmos. And, and I then argue that that has to be regarded as sacred which we used to do, as you're right, through believing God gave it to us and God was the creator and we, our obligation was to hold it in trust. But I think what I, I got into big trouble for this. I then suggested that we need two concepts of the sacred, the religious sacred for those who are religious and can still rely on that older way which is not obsolete by any means, far from it. Um, but I, we also need a secular sacred in order to ground this idea that we do have this trust that we must hold and we do have these natural inherent obligations. Now, when I suggested this, there was absolute outrage and it got on CBC radio and everybody, people on both sides were furious. The people on the religious side said I was a disaster because I was denigrating the sacred and they were just not going to tolerate it. And the people on the secular side said I was a disaster because I was trying to convert them to religion. And, and one, of my, one of my students who heard this debate on the radio came up to me at the end of a class, this is when I was still at McGill, and he said, you know, Professor Somerville, you've got everybody mad at you. And I said, yeah, I know. And he said, well, he said, when everybody's mad at you, maybe you're onto something important. And so I think that is really important. And I think it's another example of where we can both have that experience um, I would call it an experience of the sacred, whether we find it through religion or we find it through uh, nature, for example, or through the, uh, what the new science is showing us. And I've recently published a fairly long paper, which I was incredibly surprised got accepted in the journal Ethics and Behaviour, uh, and the paper is called, Could the Wonder Equation Help Us to Be More Ethical? And in that paper, I conclude that what we need are experiences of amazement, wonder, and awe at what nature slash creation, science slash are. And that there's, there's not conflict between science and religion if you regard it in the right way. And so I've, I've in, you know, I can send you the reference for that paper, then if you like it. Yeah, I would, I would love it. Um, I don't think we still don't have any questions. So I'm just going to continue the conversation with you because it's, I find it really intriguing. And just for the sake of argument, I'm going to push back a little. Um, so I agree with you that that goes a far way. So in other words, I think in order to have respect for nature, to have respect for life and living beings, you obviously need to move beyond a uh, strictly materialist view, right? That we're just uh, machines, automatons, molecules in motion, and that, that even any organism is, sentient organisms particularly, are worthy of respect and so on. But that's, so that goes a far way, I think, to mend the sort of scientific materialist uh, view of things that has denigrated personhood and, and respect for life. But I mean, the ancient world had many you know, instances where you have that kind of wonder and respect, and yet it did not lead you automatically to the respect for the person that we've known after going through the history of, uh, let me just say, uh, what, we have, what we have gained from the Judeo-Christian spectrum. So you could have great wonder for nature and be sensitive, respect for life, but you would still send your your grandma or grandpa couldn't walk with the tribe anymore. You give them food for three days, put them under a tree, and you walk off, and they will eventually die and be torn to pieces by wild animals. Now, we don't do that anymore um, for, for certain reasons, and I think those are historically grown reasons. So 
respect for life based on the sacred still seems to me somewhat a, a, you know, a, a regression, like you, you, don't you need to define what the sacred is? Like people have different views of what the sacred might be and that might not result necessarily in the kind of respect for the human that somebody like Charles Taylor too assumes, right? When he talks about these different kind of humanisms, like the one that is uh, the devout humanism of religion that leads more to the kind of human flourishing respect and then other forms of humanism that may not. So I just wonder how you'd react to that. Well, you know, in that talk, I talked about values that are not uh, set in concrete, that they evolve and that they model, I suggest, of the helix allows them to evolve, I think, with the greatest insight into what they should be. Now, right. here, here in Australia, the Aboriginal people are uniformly, adamantly anti-euthanasia. And you look back at, you know, the sort of example that you gave of leaving them under a tree or, you know, we used to hear in Canada, I don't know if you still hear it, about putting elderly people on an ice floe. And uh, one way to look at that is to say, well, you're abandoning them. But one of the Aboriginal people explained to me that in fact, they left the person behind because the person couldn't keep up with the mob moving on. And, and it was cruel to try to make them do that. And so, you know, we do make that distinction in the current euthanasia debate about killing a person, which is euthanasia, giving them a lethal injection, and allowing them to die when further intervention is simply prolongation of dying, not of living. And um, I, I for, for instance, I believe fully in the right to have uh, life support treatment withdrawn, et cetera. And I think that the people who oppose that in circumstances where it's clearly medically futile really do a lot to promote euthanasia because then you've got people who say, well, you know, these people are just want life they don't they don't care about and of course they bring up the concept of quality of life as a matter of fact I did a discussion with Peter Singer about 10 days ago and it's been recorded for our medical students and that was one of the issues on which we disagreed about what was the relevance of quality of life to ethical decision making Oh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, what you're bringing up then is a very broad spectrum of bioethical issues. And we have to be careful not to generalize too much and go off track, you know, you have to, you have, that's, see, bioethics is, in, is in applied ethics. You've got to look at the situation, you've got to look at the level at which it exists. Is it micro or individual, meso or institutional, macro or society? or mega or global. So, for example, COVID is a global ethical issue. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple of questions. If I read them out for you, just let me know if you've understood or not the technique, you know, just so the technology works. So the first one is, um, how do you shelter the freedom of the person to resist totalitarian pressure to conform to some bioethics program that is promoted for the common good that contradicts reason. You want me to read it again? Uh, yeah, no, 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 I, uh, no, I see. Um, well, I just, I'd have to have an example of what the person means. Uh, both, uh, both the individual person's autonomy and protecting the protecting the individual's autonomy and protecting or promoting the common good, they are both relevant considerations. And in bioethics decision making in a given situation that involves both of them, 
you try to balance them so that you do the least harm possible. That's what I, when I talked about um, a world of competing sorrows, that's the situation where there is no no harm option. You're either going to harm the person's autonomy by saying, no, you can't do that, or you're going to harm the common good by saying, yes, you can do it. And so it's a matter of balancing. And one of my one of my criticisms of the of the sort of pure progressive value is that they don't do that balancing. They go for the individual autonomy every time. And I think that that book I mentioned by Professor Truman in the last slide, that's a good insight into why that's happened, because the locus of the concern has shifted to realizing what they call the authentic self. And you've got to have absolutely unlimited autonomy if that's what you think you want to do. And um, so, uh, and, I, and I don't get that reason would oppose it because it, there's reason on both sides. Mm -hmm. You've got the reason to protect the individual autonomy is that, you know, we don't want tyranny. And you've got the reason to protect the common good because we don't want fragile and vulnerable people being harmed. And, you know, in any given situation, and the other thing you have to do, you've got to act proportionally, but you also have to seek the least invasive, least restrictive alternative, reasonably available and likely to achieve a valid ethical purpose. Now, that's a mouthful, but that's the uh, ethical criterion that applies here. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have time for one more question here. I'll read it out again. What are some strategies to challenge presentism and to develop a robust appreciation of what we can learn from the past, particularly for young people today? Well, I think the best way is to use that analogy that I used at the end where the progressives have gone to the past to look at climate change and to point out to them that that's what they're doing. And therefore, they, they it is relevant to look to the past and then to look to the future to you. And I think that they're certainly, I think the progressives are better at this in relation to climate change than the conservatives are. In fact, I shudder when I hear some of the conservatives there and their denial of climate change. I, I just think it's appalling. And I've had a colleague here, uh, some, he's actually a Canadian. Uh, he's been a friend of mine for 30 years, but I've been really having fights with him because he's anti-vaccination for COVID. And you see that, or certainly anti any pressure, not even man, it doesn't even have to be mandatory, it just has to be pressure, like you can't go to the football game unless you can show that you're vaccinated. He's outraged by that. And he says, absolute libertarian. And I just think that's totally irresponsible. So he and I have been having a few brawls over this. I mean, I'm worried about it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Those are good examples. Um, we will end the public session here. And uh, in about 10 minutes time, uh, we will meet again. I think you have a different link for this, uh, Professor Sandoval, with uh, the smaller seminar class here. Just have another uh, half hour or so for questionings um, in a more intimate circle. So I just want to thank you uh, for the public lecture, which is very rich, very informative. Thank you for your for answering the questions. And um, I will bid everybody else out there goodbye. And Professor Somerville, we'll see you in about 10 minutes uh, just for the second round of questioning within the smaller class. I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody for listening and I hope it was worth your time. So thanks a lot. And thank you for the privilege of uh, having given the first Houston Center lecture. I appreciate that very much. The privilege is ours, thank you. So that's...